name is Jonathan Brown, um, and I'm going to be the, web, the, the moderator for today's webinar. And I'd like to very much welcome you to today's session, which has been um, organized by the Gastro Plus User Group. It's actually our third webinar of 2014. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce um, Susie Zhang. And Susie is from the FDA, and she's going to be talking around the application of physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling in generic drug evaluation. A little bit of background on, on Susie. Um, she's a staff fellow and a pharmacologist in the Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling um, in the FDA. Her main responsibility is to implement modeling and simulation in various regulatory activities. This includes bioequivalence guidance development, research study protocol development, and general consulting responses. Her research interests are around utilizing physiologically based absorption and pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic modeling for bioequivalence assessment. And Dr. Zhang received her PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from the University of Michigan in 2009. So it's my, my very great pleasure to introduce Susie today. Just before I hand over, um, just a couple of um, aspects to make you aware of. Um, we will be recording today's webinar, and it will be available um, for future reference on the, the Simulation Plus website. Susie plans to talk for approximately 45 minutes. Um, and thereafter, we plan there to be time for questions and discussion. If you'd like to ask a question, if something triggers your interest or you've got a query, um, within the GoToMeeting setup, there is a questions box. And I would ask participants to include their questions in that box, um, type them in, and then in the time at the end, we'll go through the questions um, and give some time for Susie to, um, to, to discuss around the, the points that have been raised. So with that, um, I very much look forward to today's session, and I'd like to hand over to Susie. OK, thank you very much, John, for the nice introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to have this opportunity to share with you some of our experience um, using PDPK modeling in the context of generic drug evaluation. So far, majority of our PPC modeling projects are related to oral solid dosage forms, but we are very interested in expanding to other routes of administration, which I will touch a little bit in the presentation. So as always, the views expressed in this presentation are those of the speaker and not necessarily those of the Food and Drug Administration. So for today's seminar, I will first give you an update on PPPK modeling simulation in the Office of Generic Drugs. Then I'll present four case examples where we use mechanistic oral absorption modeling simulation to address equivalence issues and support decision making. And finally, challenges opportunities in this area. They always go hand by hand. Um, the the core of generic drug approval is the demonstration of equivalence, which includes pharmaceutical equivalence and bioequivalence. It's not better, not worse, but equivalent to ensure switchability between the reference and the generic drug product. The main business of the Office of Research Standards, which is the new sub-office under the Office of Generic Drugs, is to translate research into standards for generic drug evaluation. In earlier this year, we published a commentary in the Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, which summarized some of our previous work using oral absorption modeling simulation to address questions such as, is the in vitro dissolution profile predictive of in vivo performance, and to evaluate partial AUCs as additional bioequivalence metrics to evaluate risks 
of in vivo I call induced do dumping to investigate the sensitivity of PK parameters to the change of critical formulation factors, so on and so forth. Some of the details were published previously as research articles, and we hope we can share more experience in the future. But here is the reference that you can uh, read if you are interested. Um, besides oral absorption, we are also very interested in exploring quantitative tools to assess generic drug products for other routes of administration, including but are not limited to dermatological drug products, ocular products, nasal and pulmonary products, and complex drug products. Many of these products act locally and systemic drug exposure may be irrelevant or not detectable. Predictive models bridging in vitro performance with in vivo performance for these drug products are very useful in generic drug development and evaluation. Um, this year, Office of Generic Drugs awarded seven grants in the first five categories. If you have innovative research proposals intended to address challenges involved in generic regulatory science, I encourage you to submit your proposal in response to the broad agency agreement announcement posted on our Budufa Regulatory Science website, which also uh, is listed on the slide. Now I'll move uh, on to case examples where we use absorption modeling simulation for bioequivalence assessment. And I'll give you four case examples, including immediate release as well as modified release products and drugs with short half-life and long half-life, and cases where in vitro dissolution is in vivo predictive, also where cases also cases where in vitro dissolution is not so in vivo predictive. Um, this figure is the advanced compartmental absorption and transit model in GastroPlus, which you all are very familiar with. So basically, the GI tract is divided into nine compartments. In each compartment, the drug product may exist as unreleased, undissolved, and dissolved forms. All three forms may transit along the GI tract. The dissolved form is available to be absorbed. For the distribution elimination model, we usually use empiric one, two, or three compartment models because for the purpose of generic drug evaluation, once the drug is absorbed and circulating in the body, um, the reference drug product and the test product should perform the same since it's totally dependent upon the drug properties. In some cases, we also use whole body physiologically based distribution elimination model, such as when transporters, enzyme induction or inhibition, or nonlinear pharmacokinetics are involved so that we can better describe the distribution and elimination phase. So for each project, we usually start from data collection from literature as well as in-house database, including physical chemical properties of drug substance, formulation properties of drug products, pharmacokinetic data uh, uh, for drug, drug substance, and any types of data useful for model development, development and validation. And then we develop PBPK absorption models. We validate the model against as many available data sets as possible and then we run various simulations to address specific questions for your needs and for our needs. Um, the first example I'm going to talk about is uh, the absorption model for acetamin salts oral product. The purpose of this modeling is for risk assessment to identify potential areas having equivalence issues. So specific questions asked are, whether by current conclusion drawn from healthy adult population can be extrapolated to other patient populations, since these type of products are widely described in children. So we want to know if by current in adults is also by current in children. We also wanted to evaluate potential risks associated with wide associated with wide dissolution specification we observed for one of the generics. 
and finally evaluate the sensitivity of PK parameters to the change of critical formulation factors. So in this case, we actually simulated for two very similar products, LOXR capsules and dextrin ER capsules. LOXR capsules are mixed amphetamine salts consisting of equal amount of four amphetamine salts. The ratio of dextrin amphetamine salts to liver amphetamine salts is 3 to 1. The ratio of base dextrin amphetamine to base liver amphetamine is approximately 3.15 to 1. And dextrin ER capsules consist of only dextrin, dextrin amphetamine sulfate. Both products are designed as multi-phasic modified release products with different immediate release slash delayed release or immediate release extended release ratios. Um, the BKA of amphetamine is about 9.9, .9, so it is high across physiological range. Log P is about 1.8. Permeability predicted by enemy T predictor is high and mean elimination uh, half-lives are slightly different in various populations and also different between dextrin and liver amphetamine with longer half-lives for liver amphetamine. Uh, we have separate models for dextrin and liver amphetamine. Both models share the same phys physical chemical properties but different PK parameters, that is um, clearance, clearance and volume distribution. Um, so for PK um, parameters, uh, we obtain the clearance and volume distribution uh, by fitting one, two, and three compartment models to the observed plasma concentration time profiles of both isomers after oral administration of the immediate release uh, tablets in PK plus. And uh, one, we select one compartment model in this case based on goodness of fit. Uh, we optimize permeability to get a better prediction for the immediate release tablet. And the optimized permeability is very close to the LMT predicted value and still considered as high permeability. Uh, in this case, we use Metoprolol as the permeability um, standard. The model was further validated against a BID study under that condition um, the two figures on the right-hand side showing the PK um, prediction for the FAT study. So the, the default gastroplast FAT model was used in this case. Uh, the, black, the black lines in these two figures are observed mean profile, and the blue lines are simulated mean profiles without re-optimization. The terminal phase is a little bit off because the PK parameters used in this simulation were obtained from a different PK study in a different population. Therefore, it is reasonable to optimize the PK parameters against this data set. And the red lines are simulated PK profiles after re-optimization. So overall, the model can reasonably predict dextrin and label amphetamine PK profiles after administration of mixed amphetamine salt IR tablets. Um, and then we move to model. We move to modeling LOXR capsules. LOXR capsules contain immediate release and delayed release pallets with a ratio of one to one in terms of drug load. The entire coating is designed to be stable in acidic conditions and disintegrate when pH is about certain values. Since the delayed release portion does not transit through the stomach as a monolith, monolith, the pallet dispersed once the capsule disintegrates in the stomach and continuously transits out of the stomach into the arginine and small intestine. So enteric, um, coat, so enteric coated pallets behave more similar to uh, sustained release formulations. To model L or XR, we use mixed multiple dose in gastroplast. Um, we give equal dose of immediate release capsule and the delayed release multi-pipe enteric coat at the same time. And we use the Z-factor model 
for the solution model. The Z vector, the Z vector for this the solution model was obtained from uh, the solution profiles measured in pH 6.8 medium. Um, up to optimize for the PK parameters, again, since this is a different study, the model is able to predict the PK profiles after the administration of LR capsules. And we also modeled for a generic product, which is designed differently than from the RLD in the, in the uh, extended release portion, where the release of the generic product is independent of pH. So we use tabulated dissolution data measures in pH 1.2 media, which seems most in vivo indi indicative after plug-in all available dissolution data. So to model generic product, we actually test all the uh, dissolution profiles measured in various pH. And we found that the dissolution profile measured in pH 1.2 is the most in vivo indicated, so we use that as input for to model the generic product. And we use um, CR disperse, disperse in this case rather than use the VR uh, multi-part entire code. And the model could reasonably predict the mean PK profile for the generic product as well. But I'm not showing the PK profile in, in this slide. So remember that one of our goals was to assess potential risks of inequivalence in different populations. So after models are validated uh, against the several PK data set, we conducted simulation in children and adolescent populations since this product is widely prescribed in children. Uh, we, give, we give the model GI physiology in, physiology and PK parameters in children and adolescents, which we obtain from literature. So as you can see, although absolute PK parameters, PK profiles are different across those populations. However, the test versus reference ratios in terms of PK parameters remain the same. So that is, by equivalence conclusion, it's still valid in children and adolescents and the lessons based on point estimate assessment. We further investigate potential inequivalence in other specific populations. To do this, we varied one parameter at a time in a predefined range. Range simulations for the test and the reference product and the calculate T to R ratios. So this is essentially primary sensitivity analysis, but instead of using up absolute PK parameters such as Cmax, Tmax, or AUC as the response. Now well, we use the T to R ratio as the response. So by running all phys physiological parameters, we identified that TR ratios deviate from baseline in subjects with prolonged stomach emptying time. This makes sense because uh, if you think that the reference product is pH trick release, so while the, while the generic is pH independent release, so for subject with prolonged, prolonged stomach emptying time, the reference does not release while the drug, while, while the drug product is in, in the stomach. But the generic may start to release after a certain time, even the drug is in the stomach. However, we conclude that the risk is low because the prolonged stomach emptying time needs to be very long to deviate the TR ratio outside 80 to 129 by equivalence limit. And it is, it is rare to have such a long stomach emptying time on the fasting condition. Um, so we further observed that the, the solution specification for the generic product is pretty wide. So is it, so the question we ask is, 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 is it possible that a release batch needs the specification, but is not able to demonstrate by equivalence. Um, this time, we use the generic itself as the reference, which is the red one you see in the figure. And the red simulations using virtual dissolution input, which are still within the dissolution specification range, um, such as the high and the low in the left figure of the, the, the dissolution um, 
profile. And we run thousands of Spikuna simulations. Um, we run thousands of Spikuna simulations to test whether uh, those virtual um, products are equivalent to the reference product. So, with uh, as you can, the results are shown in the table in this slide. As you can see, with moderate number of subjects. The passing rate is about 100% comparing reference versus reference, suggesting that the variability we actually gave to each physi physiology parameter was reasonable. And also, based, and also based on the high passing rate, we may conclude that the high formulation and the reference and the reference is equivalent. However, the low formulation may be problematic, although it meets the uh, specification. So we further evaluate more batches with different virtual dissolution profiles. Um, in these two figures, we have three virtual dis uh, virtual uh, generic products, and the low five percent and the low ten percent profiles are five percent and low percent lower than the reference dissolution profile, respectively. The low 180 minutes is the same as the low one, uh, low 10 percent. Expect that it had the final point of 85 percent at 180 minutes. One that is about three hours. Uh, so again, we ran uh, thousands of equivalent simulations um, to test the passing rate of uh, each different uh, comparison. So with the same uh, number of subjects. The passing rate comparing uh, reference versus low 5% is higher than comparing reference versus uh, low 10%, which is expected because the 5% is more like the reference product. However, we also observe that the passing rate comparing reference versus low 180 minutes profile are the highest uh, among the three comparisons suggesting that the percent dissolved at 180 minutes is critical. So based on this simulation, we recommend the uh, specification to be revised um, to have a time point at three hours. Um, the model was further extended to dextrin and vitamin sulfate ER capsules. The formulation of dextro antitamine sulfate ER capsules is different from that of LOXR capsules. So um, dextro uh, antitamine sulfate ER capsules were modeled as immediate release and uh, control release dispersed uh, dosage form in gastropods. So in um, the in vitro dissolution uh, we observed is pH independent. However, it is in vivo predictive. So in this case, we use. However, it is not in vivo uh, predictive. So in the in this case, we use an optimized verbal function for the control release portion to simulate the PK profiles. Um, the by using verbal function give us flexibility to change the verbal parameters to simulate various um, virtual generic simulations that I will talk a little bit in, 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 uh, in later. Uh, so the purpose of the simulation is to assess the sensitivity of various PK metrics to the change of formulation factors. Uh, we tested the um, test reference ratios of early, middle, and the late partial AUCs, as well as the traditional PK metric, CMAX to the change of uh, I near release and sustained release ratio, and the release, as well as the releasing rate of the uh, uh, control release portion. So this table in this slide shows the passing rate of various PK metrics for formulations with different ratios of IR to SR combination uh, using different number, numbers of subjects. As can be seen from the table, when you have about 10% uh, variation uh, in the IRSR combination, um, 
CMAX, CMAX and middle or late partial AUCs are not so sensitive to detect the change while uh, the early partial AUC is able to detect the change of IR and SR ratio. Um, we further investigate the sensitivity of partial AUCs to the change of releasing rate of SR portion. Um, so to do this, we, uh, we, we, we varied vocal parameters, which is the time scale of the shape factors to achieve different uh, release rates for virtual generic products. So as can be seen from um, this figure, um, we show that the uh, PR ratio change, the change of the, 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 the PR ratio change with the change of uh, time scale parameters in the uh, warp, in the warp function. And simulation sh shows that middle or late partial AUCs does not add additional value to ensure bioequivalence since in this case CMAX is the most sensitive um, metric to the change of verbal function. So uh, from the simulation for um, mixed amphetamine sort ER capsules and dextrose amphetamine sulfate ER capsules we conclude that um, B by coolant most likely can be extrapolated from healthy subjects to other populations. Uh, risks, risks of bioinfluence may be associated with batch that meet the solution specification um, because the specification is pretty wide. And simulations could be conducted to identify the appropriate specification. Early partial AUC is sensitive to the change in IRER or IRSR ratio, and late partial AUC does not add additional values to ensure bioequivalence because the max is the most sensitive um, metric in this case to detect the uh, release rate change in the uh, extended release portion. Um, the second case uh, I'm going to give is the absorption model for methylphenidate hydrochloride oral product. The main purpose of this modeling simulation is to assess the sensitivity of various peak and metrics to the change of formulation factors. Um, so we have approved a lot of methylphenidate hydrochloride in oral product. And this table shows you the approved methylphenidate uh, hydrochloride oral product on the new drug application pathway. Majority of these products consist of racemic mixture of zero form of methylphenidate hydrochloride. Only focaline and focaline XR consist of focaline and focaline consist of uh, dex methylphenidate hydrochloride as active ingredients. Our focus, our focus of simulation is the last several products which are intended for once daily administration. So among, among these five once daily products, Concerta is um, formulated as IR, uh, ER um, combination where the ER is the osmotic uh, control release uh, delivery system and the other ER products are formulated as IR, ER, or IR, DR beads with different ratios of these two portions. So methylphenidate has a PKA around 8.7, and it has high solubility across the physiology range. And the predicted um, log P is about 2. Um, and the predictive permeability is high. It is relatively stable in acidic media, but degrades extensively in basic solution. And the average elimination half-life is about two to three hours. So if you think about this drug substance due to the short half-life, high solubility, high permeability properties, you would expect to, you would expect to in vitro in vivo correlation for this type of product since, the form, since it is the formulation 
not a control the release of the of drug, the release and the absorption of the drug. So again, we started from modeling uh, IV intravenous um, PK and uh, immediate immediate release oral dosage forms to get PK parameters. Uh, in this case, we found the PK after intravenous administration and used that data to obtain the PK parameters. Um, two compartment PK model was selected to describe the distribution and elimination. And since lethal methanidate concentration is very low, so in future we'll just focus on the DEX and the total methanidate PK profile, uh, which are which are very close actually. Um, so in the oral model, we integrated the chemical degradation in the GI lumen, the enzyme and the enzyme metabolism. Um, the model was optimized against a mean PK profile after single dose administration of Ritalin, which is the uh, upper PK profile um, for Vmax in the mechanical equation and stomach amping time. And the model was further validated against the uh, against a PK data set from a different study after TID administration of Ritalin, which is immediate immediate release formulation. The only difference between the top and the bottom PK models were the dose and dose regimen. The figure uh, the, this figure shows that the model can reasonably describe the PK after TID administration, uh, which give us confidence on the model. So we move the model uh, from immediate release to uh, controlled release um, dosage forms. Uh, so um, in this slide show, shows you absorption model for Concerta. For Concerta, we used uh, mixed um, multiple doses, dosage form in gastric class with immediate release solution to account for the rapid release and controlled release, uh, gastric release for uh, osmotic controlled release. So for osmotic controlled release portion, um, the, the, the drug transit along the GI, GI tract as a um, integrated tablet. So that's why we um, pick control release, gastric release dosage form to model the ER um, portion. So in this case, we actually, we, we were able to use in vitro dissolution profiles to reasonably predict PK profiles. Um, so as you can see uh, in this um, figures, and we use this in vitro um, dissolution profiles and of the PK profile can be reasonably predicted. So we use the Concerta model as the basis for other methanidate um, modified release products. To model metadata CD, we uh, again we use mixed multiple dose dosage form, uh, but with IR capsule to account for the IR beads and CR dispersed. To, uh, mo to model the ER portion of, med of metadata CD. So in this case, we observed the pH independent in vitro dissolution. However, the however, when we plug in the in vitro dissolution profile, it does not predict the in vivo uh, PK profile. So uh, in, in other words, in vitro dissolution profile are not so in vivo in indicative. Um, so in this case, we uh, optimize the uh, wobble function and use this optimized wobble, wobble function to predict the in vivo uh, PK profile. But as you can see, after four hours, the in vitro and the optimized dissolution curves are parallel, suggesting that the correlation may exist. Um, but in this case, we do not go further to explore the in vitro in vivo correlation, um, which we, we, may, we, we could do in the future. And the two model for choline XR, which is the dexamethanidate hydrochloride extended release dosage form, 
So again, we use mixed multiple dose with IR and CR dispersed. Um, so the delayed release pallet acts more like a sustained release formulation uh, since the pallets continuously travel out of the stomach into the duodenum. Um, so our setup with control release dispersed is, is, is essentially modeling the average behavior of each particle. Um, so again, the, in this case, um, the, we optimize the verbal parameter um, to better predict the PK profile uh, for focal XR. So in, if, uh, so in this slide, the uh, red line, which is the original the solution profile, if we plug in that profile, and as you can see, the profile on the predict the second peak of uh, focal XR PK profile. So we, in this case, we optimize our verbal function to have a better prediction. And uh, the, the second peak, the second peak of focal XR uh, PK profile is improved after we uh, optimize verbal function. So remember that the purpose of this model simulation is to assess uh, the sensitivity of different PK parameters to the change of formulation. So uh, we do this for both uh, metadata CD as well as Focoin XR, but uh, I'm just going to show you the result for one, re one example for Focoin XR. Uh, so mm, when uh, when we uh, when we check the sensitivity of PK matrix to the change of formulation factors, we only check the releasing rate of the ER portion. Of course, you can also vary the uh, IR and the ER ratios uh, if you are in, for example, early drug development uh, to for bicurrent for bicurrent assessment. Uh, since the ER portion for both focal XR as well as metadata CD were modeled as verbal function, so we were able to change the verbal parameters to reflect various releasing rate. Um, here I'm only showing an example of for focal XR. So we fixed, uh, the, in this case, we fixed the lag time and changed the scale and the shape factors in the verbal function simultaneously. And the left figure is a control plot mapping the TR ratios for four PK metrics. Um, here, the max two indicates the second peak of focally XR PK profiles. So formulation G is a hypothetic formulation um, that falls on the edge of 80 to 120, 125 by limits of partial AUC from 3 to 8, which is the uh, orange line, and um, C max 2, which is the red line, and barely outside of A125, the BE limit of partial AUC uh, 8 to 12. And um, the, uh, the figures on the right hand side are the, uh, in the, the in vivo dissolution profiles of formulation G as well as predicted PK profile uh, for the formulation G. Um, so this 3D um, parameter sensitivity analysis showed that a middle and a late partial AUC is able to detect the second peak of so-called XR PK profiles and ensure PK profile similarity between the reference and um, generic product. Um, so to conclude, in, for this case example, we developed the absorption models for various um, methylphenidate hydrochloride and the dexmethylphenidate hydrochloride extended release products for the purpose of assessing the sensitivity of PK matrix to the change of formulation. Um, the in vivo is the in, the in vitro dissolution is able to predict conserved high PK. Uh, however, in vitro dissolution is not uh, so in vivo indica in, indicative for focal R and melanin CD. 
and the model can be used to map formulations that pass various BE metrics. And one step further, which we did not do, would be developing in vitro and in vivo correlation to uh, inform product development. Um, so for 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 the third example, I'm going to show you is uh, about the morphine sodium tablet, which is an immediate release product. So for this project, we wanted to explore the impact of critical drug uh, substance properties and formulation factors on the in vivo performance. And we want to investigate the impact of slower dissolution, which we observed in acidic pH media on the bioavailability or by equivalent. And we want to explore in vitro in vivo correlation shift if exists. Uh, Warfarin sodium has a pKa of 5.3 about uh, low solubility in acidic media and high so solubility in base media. Uh, predicted log P is about 2.6. In vitro and in vitro KCO2 and the PEMPA studies showed high permeability and, and uh, it has pretty long half-life with average about 40 hours in range in range from 20 to 60 hours. So we used various solubility values reported by different sites. Um, in this case, we use Johnson model uh, for this for dissolution um, model in gastropass. As we can see in this figure in the table, solubility difference in low pH media does not have much impact on pK. Um, and we also notice that the model did not capture the early Pmax. So now if we look at uh, in vivo dissolution profile and compare the in vivo to in vitro dissolution, uh, we, we see that much bigger difference between uh, the low and the fast formulations uh, in the first hour um, in, in vivo dissolution. Um, both in vitro and in vivo dissolution are rapid uh, and complete within one hour. Uh, we conducted parameter sensitivity analysis um, to show uh, to show that um, so the parameter sensitivity analysis showed that the PR ratio of PK parameters in terms of Cmax and AUCP do not change significantly with the change of particle size and the density. Um, we also explore the effect of those on pK. So under single single dose condition, the PR ratio, so pK parameters change linearly with the change of dose, which justifies our tighter control on the potency for this narrow therapeutic index drug. Um, as I mentioned, we uh, we we observe different dissolution rates in various P, uh, pH media. So in order to assess the impact of slow dissolution in acidic media um, by coolants, we incorporated V-factor dissolution model. So, so in this model, we actually use V-factor dissolution model rather than the Johnson dissolution model. Um, the V-factor shown on this, uh, in this table was fitted to in vitro dissolution data on the three different pH condition. And we use the Z factor versus pH profile as model input. Um, the reference Z factor, Z factors are, uh, are the uh, Z factors obtained from in vitro dissolution data. We also generated some virtual, uh, virtual formulation with lower dissolution rate. And the table on the left side shows um, that shows that a formulation that does not dissolve at all in low pH conditions, such as pH 1.2 and 4.5, um, and had one order of magnitude slower dissolution in pH 6.5, um, may still achieve 82% of Cmax of the reference formulation, so just suggesting that 
dissolution rate in pH 6.8 is more relevant to the PK performance. So we further explored model ability to predict in vitro in vivo correlation or IVIVC. So in a paper published in the 70s, in vitro and in vivo correlation was developed and claimed for three warfarin formulations. Both strain formulations showed different difference in release rate in pH 7.5 media as shown in this figure. So although um, the two slow release formulations did not reach 100% dissolution in three hours, the three formulations still showed bicoolance based on the average bicoolance analysis. So we fit those dissolution uh, data in v factor model um, use the immediate release model. Uh, however, the model predict that the immediate release model um, predict that um, all the uh, all the um, three formulations are uh, very uh, close, and essentially the PK uh, PKs are the same. So the so the immediate release uh, model does not really uh, capture the IVC. Uh, feature, but we also noticed that the two slow dissolution formulations reach about 80 percent uh, dissolution in three hours, including the 30 uh, minutes incubation in acidic media. So we may consider using control release dosage form um, in gastroplast to model uh, to model to model this uh, study, which may may better uh, capture the solute dissolution, solute dissolution as well as uh, predict the in vitro in vivo correlation. So for the warfarin absorption model, um, we conclude, we, uh, what we get is uh, the model does not really capture the early Gmax, which we uh, need to work a little bit more on it. Um, solubility in low pH particle size and particle density does not have significant uh, impact on the bioavailability. The solution rate at pH 6.5 is the most uh, relevant uh, condition to bioavailability. Um, the dose or the potency impacts pK, so that's why we need to tightly control the potency or uh, the assay. Um, model needs to uh, being proved for a better IVIC prediction. So the last example I'm going to share with you is the absorption modeling for methylamine extended release capsule. Uh, for this e example, we wanted to assess the relation between GI luminal concentration and plasma concentration for this locally acting G um, drug product. Um, methylamine has um, three pKa values. And the right uh, and the right figure shows the, solub the solubility versus um, pH profile. Uh, as you can see, um, the solubility is low between pH three to six. Um, Mesalamine also has a very short half life, with about forty two minutes after IV administration, and it is a GI locally acting drug, targeting the lower GI tract. So to model uh, Masamin ER capsules, uh, we first developed the PK model using PK data after IV oral suspension and suppository administration. And then we fit the in vitro dissolution data measured in various pH media to the Z-factor model um, to account for different dissolution rates in different pH media. We then deconvolute PK profiles for each subject in one study by adjusting the pH in GI lumen against observed PK profiles. And finally, we'll perform simulations to answer specific questions. So as you can see in this figure, model can reasonably predict uh, mean PK profiles after IV, uh, oral suspension, as well as in our capsule. Uh, model needs improvement for suppository prediction. So actually, for suppository, uh, it was a one compartment uh, model. So basically, when I did the uh, modeling, I just uh, forced the transit time in the other compartment to be zero uh, for compulsory administration. Um, 
So and then uh, and after after this modeling and and then we look at the GI luminal concentration as well as plasma concentration uh, for each subject. Uh, so these two figures show the relationship between colon exposure and plasma exposure. Uh, each circle in these figures represent one subject in PK study that we uh, modeled. Um, so as you can see from these figures, uh, partial AU, plasma partial AUC from 3 to T has a better relationship with the co uh, total, total colon exposure then the partial AUC, plasma partial AUC from A to T. So to conclude for um, Masami, uh, we developed a physiologically based um, model which has the potential to predict uh, GI local exposure. However, model needs to be further validated against observed local concentration which could be very um, difficult. So in these four examples I just presented, uh, we have drugs with very long half-life and very short half-life. We have immediate release and extended release formulations, as well as cases where we have uh, in vitro dissolution is in vivo indicated, as well as in vitro dissolution which uh, that are not so in vivo indicated. Um, so I, I think personally, PDTK absorption modeling simulation demonstrated its value in uh, generic drug evaluation. So based on um, our experience, my experience, here, um, here are my personal opinions on some of the challenge areas. So for our absorption, we wanted to improve colon absorption because we have more and more uh, modified release drug products as well as a lot of uh, drug products in, in, intended for locally acting. Um, and we want to study more on the impact of hydrodynamic, hydro, GI hydrodynamics. So far, uh, I don't think um, the modern gastroplasty has uh, integrated hydrodynamic effects. Um, and we want to see if it has significant impact or not. Uh, if it is, we may want to incorporate it. And food effect prediction is always wanted but difficult. This may be because, maybe because a lot of time we just don't know the mechanism of food effect. And for non-oral administration, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we are very interested in expanding and exploring in those areas. And to me, because a lot of those products uh, act locally, so model validation is um, could be very difficult for those types of uh, drug products. And of course, because, uh, because we don't have a lot of experience, so we may see um, a, lot, um, a lot more challenges uh, when we actually do this type of modeling. So at the end, I want to uh, thank my colleagues, especially Andrew uh, the, the key, who did a lot of this uh, modeling simulation work. Uh, Dr. Jiang Hongfan, uh, Rob Lineberg, Wen Lei Jiang, Tu Xiamini, Chris, Andrew, and uh, my colleagues in the Office of Research and um, Standards. Uh, before I uh, finish, I'd also like to take this opportunity to advise, advertise a little bit uh, the job opportunities with the Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling. Um, if you are interested in um, exploring uh, opportunities with our division, please feel free to send your CV to my email address, which is listed in this slide. And now I'd like to take uh, any questions and thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Susie. Thank you for a very interesting um, talk, which has actually um, has generated a number of questions. So. What I'd like to do is just to run through these questions and the, the comments that have come through, um, and perhaps you can you can provide your thoughts on them. So the first one came through from David Hahn, um, and he said it um, he'd be very interested to hear whether there are any instances of PBPK modeling being used as the basis for a biowaver or for spec setting for API particle size, etc. Um. 
So I guess um, I'm, I'm not quite familiar with um, new drug application. So I guess there may be more examples in new drug application. Uh, but I haven't seen um, any examples in generic um, application. But as, as I uh, as I presented in one of my uh, uh, examples, we used uh, this type of model simulation to assess the uh, specification, uh, which we observed a very wide specification uh, at a later time point. Um, so we actually conducted this model simulation. Um, and we, uh, based on our simulation, we recommend um, the revision of the spectrum specification. Of course, that is for a uh, modified release product. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. So the, the, the next question was from Jamie Yanez. Um, and she's asking, I think, in the example where we extrapolated between um, adult simulations and child and adolescent uh, simulations. She was asking, what was the physiology modified using real parameters to fit the child and adolescent data? So we actually use data found in the literature. But I think GastroPlus can scale the physiology parameter to children. But you have to be aware in terms of pH, but it, because it only uh, scales the geometry. so. Um, so we have to look at, explore the pH in this, the, the pH in the GI lumen in different uh, population and enter that manually. So what were you saying? It was sort of a combination. It was using the information within GastroPlus and then supplemented with the yes. pH information from the literature. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So then the next question was from Mark Lazley. Um, he said. Could you please explain further which in vitro dissolution we use for gastroplus models? What were the in vitro conditions, um, such as pH, volume of fluid, rotation speed? Um, in other words, what do we consider to be a, an in vitro biorelevant method to simulate human absorption? So I think really what, what, what he's asking is, um, what, where you use in vitro data in the simulations. Um, do, do you have a, a an in vitro dissolution method that really um, you, you feel is bio-relevant? So, um, so because, uh, well, in this, uh, this question um, does not specifically uh, point to specific uh, examples, so I'll just uh, answer in general. Uh, we have to go with the in vitro in vitro dissolution data we get. Um, most of the in vitro dissolution data we get are conducted in regular apparatus, one, two, three, uh, in regular recommended media. Um, so basically that is the in vitro dissolution uh, data we use. And also as uh, I showed in the presentation, some of the in vitro dissolution profiles are in vivo indicative, I, I, uh, I would say it's indicative or predictive, which means when we plug in those in vitro dissolution profiles, we can actually predict in vivo. But for some cases that when we use the, the in vitro dissolution profiles, we cannot directly grab the in vitro dissolution uh, profile and predict in vivo. For, for some of the cases, we have to optimize um, the wobble uh, the, the wobble parameters to get a better uh, prediction of in, in vivo um, performance. So in that case, the in vitro dissolution uh, profiles are not so, I would call it in vivo predictive. Um, so basically, I don't think, uh, I, I cannot address our relevant method because we, we can only go with the dissolution profiles we have. Mm -hmm. which are usually conducted in regular apparatus, in regular media, in regular recommended 900 milliliter condition. Yeah, and I, I would expect, actually, that um, it would depend on the compound that you were looking at as well. Yeah. Um, some compounds, such as BCS class 1, 
um, you know, a, a standard USP dissolution setup may, may, may well be bioRelevant um, or bioPredictive, whereas um, a more challenging you know, BCS class 4 compound um, is going to be much more tricky and re require alternative methodology. Good. Okay. So let's let's move on to the. Actually, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to just go out of order slightly because there's another question here that just relates to what we were discussing. Um, okay. So this was from Tracy Wellington, um, and and she says according to case study number one, bioequivalents can be extrapolated from healthy to other special populations, but the compound selected was BCS class one compound. Would you expect the conclusion to hold true for class two and class four drugs? So bringing in sort of the BCS classification again, but this time um, around the potential for extrapolation between healthy populations and special populations. Um, yes, I would say this is really a broader question. Um, BCS two and four drug compounds are like very broad, I guess. Um, it will be better to evaluate um, drug by drug rather than draw a conclusion for a category of drug products. So basically that's what I would say. Besides BCS, besides BCS properties, besides population, besides um, solubility, permeability, we may also want to consider other factors such as clearance, um, although those are uh, more like drug substance properties, less formulation related, but those uh, properties of parameters may also play a role uh, when we look at the, the, the question as a whole. That basically, that's what I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I, I think the, the, the next question was, does GastroPlus and AdMet use warfarin sodium as salt. So I guess this is referring to your warfarin example. Um, did, did you did you enter the warfarin as, as, as a salt form? And was there anything in particular that you needed to do to, to model a, a sodium salt form of warfarin? So I think gastroplus treat all compounds as base form. Uh, but we actually uh, we use the uh, solubility for measured for salt. So this pH solubility profile as input for model. Mm -hmm. would, would, would you ever consider um, sort of trying to model disproportionation effects as part of you know, modeling a salt, for example? I'm sorry, you see the question again? Have you ever tried modeling disproportionation of a salt? Sort of, uh, sort of the, the effect of a salt precipitating, perhaps. Um, mm, 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 I don't think. Well, this it's not this, something you've you tried. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. So let's have a look. So we've covered the warfarin sodium as a salt. We've covered um, Tracy's question. So there was, there was a question from Jasmine and Novakovic. Um, my concern is a potential loss of discriminatory power of dissolution test method due to optimization of the dissolution profile um, for methylphenidate using Weibull function. In other words, would it be possible to detect changes in the release rates if optimization is applied? Um. So, um, well, this is a tough question. So, in this case, it is possible, but in this case, we did not conduct in vitro in vivo correlation, which we probably should. So if we have that correlation, 
uh, we probably will be better understand in terms of the sensitivity um, difference from in vitro to in vivo. Okay, I'm just trying to think. This, since what she's referring to here is where where you've you've done a theoretical optimization, is that right? The theoretical optimization for the the, the solution for the in vivo. But when you, perhaps if, when, when you when you use the Weibull, for example, what what, what do you uh -huh. can you just talk through what you sort of do there? So we uh, so for the for the uh, extended release portion, basically we use a Weibull function to describe the in vivo as the as the as the input for the model. And what we observe that is that the in vitro dissolution is not uh, totally matched with the Weibull the optimized Weibull in input. Um, and I guess what she asked was. Uh, because we optimized use the virtual uh, function, uh, is it possible that the virtual in vivo uh, dissolution is not as sensitive um, as the in vitro? So I guess if we have a in vitro in vivo correlation in this case, um, it may be able to address the question. Okay, I'm with you. So that would be additional work that we need to do in that case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next question from was Lokesh Yadav. Um, she asks, is it possible to model the PK for highly variable molecules and its validation? So I think it's probably coming back to sort of BCS class and, and the types of molecules that you that we model. Um, do, do, do you have any thoughts on approaches for modeling compounds that we know to have variable PK? Mm, no. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I don't have much experience on this, but I will uh, keep in mind when I do projects in the future. Yeah. Okay. And I'm just looking, we've got quite a list of questions, so we may, we may not be able to cover all the questions. Um, there's, there's one here, can you elaborate on the number of cases that PBPK modeling has been successfully applied for generic drug applications? Um, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any in drug applications, but um, but as I mentioned, so we're using it uh, internally um, for general drug uh, evaluation to answer various questions. And um, if you're interested, you can uh, read the commentary short article uh, we published this year, early this year, in Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics. OK, good. Um, Julie Bassa has asked, um, is it possible to get a copy of the presentation? Um, what would you suggest there? Is, is it, we, we are going to put a recording on the website, um, which will have the, the slides on. Um, okay, yeah. You, you have the slides on. Are you... Is, is it going to be on the website? We will put them on the website, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we'll have the, the recording of the webinar will be on the website. So perhaps okay. that's the best place to actually access the, the, okay. the slides. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, Tracy Wellington. Usually for food effect in PBPK modeling, the scenarios are all or none. But when the drug is administered after or before food, could change, could cause a change in PK. Is there any way to model these situations in PBPK? So, as, yeah, as, as I mentioned, I think the food effect prediction um, can be difficult. Mm. Um, but I, I don't have the experience, and I don't know if you can um, manipulate the gastroplast 
by giving the food as a as a as a drug. I don't know if 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 you can do that in gastroplasm. I'm not quite familiar with that. Mm, yeah, I, I think that's actually quite a there may be a way to do that. I think that's quite specialized to modeling. Um, what, what I'm actually thinking, Susie, is a lot of these questions are very good and they, they probably reflect the, the interest in your presentation and the you know the interest that it sparked. Um, I'm actually thinking it would be nice to, to keep a copy of these questions and then perhaps in a future webinar we can have a, a panel address some of these questions. Okay. Um, they're actually they're actually questions that we could debate um, and, and, and discuss in, in, in some detail. Um, so I, I think you know it, it's great to get your perspective on some of these, but I, I, I do think um, for the user group it would actually be good to have another webinar where we go back to some of these and discuss some of these items. Okay. So Fagan Zhang says, were all your simulations done by GastroPlus? Yeah. Um, in this case, yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, so Philippos um, Kessizoglu says, in several occasions, you use the terminology reasonably predicts plasma levels. Do you have a recommendation of specific prediction criteria, e.g. use 15% prediction error as IVIBCs? Or do you think we still need more experience to set acceptable error? So that's a good question, actually. Um, well, when we talk yeah. about predicting, what, what do we mean? Or, or what, what do you mean when you make a statement like that? Um, well, so it depends on the purpose of your uh, modeling simulation. So for our purpose, we majority of the case, we want to evaluate uh, like PK sensitivity. Uh, so in that case, we don't need very accurate prediction of PK parameters. But in the case of you want to use um, IVIVC for uh, waiver uh, or for submission, um, then, then that's a different story. <laughs> so, um, so the the criteria for IVIVC by waiver is, is in the guidance. Um, but for other other purpose, I think we need to address case by case. Um, I think the question is uh, very uh, closely tied to the purpose of of the simulation, the modeling. Mm -hmm. So you, you have like a, a regulatory limit which is published, um, but in, in terms of what you're trying to do, you obviously depending, depending on what you're doing, you can decide if there's some flexibility in that criteria. Mm -hmm. Okay, so comment from Jun Chen. Um, she says, very interesting talk, thank you. I have one technical question about using the Weibull. You mentioned using optimized Weibull parameters gives better prediction. Is the optimization based on in vivo data or in vitro dissolution? So the op yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So I think the, the optimization is um, against the PK um, profile. So basically, it's the in vivo data. Mm, yeah. And then we have a question from, from Walt, Walt Oz from Simulations Plus. Um, he says, hydrodynamics, so this is one of the, the challenges that you mentioned at the end. Um, and it's, it's an area of, I, I know, of great interest. Um, hydrodynamics are likely to be highly variable among subjects. How do you think the effects of hydrodynamics could be modeled in a way to provide a reliable indication of likely bioequivalence? Well, Although you find it as a, a challenging area, do you have any thoughts in terms of how we might address that, that, that challenging area? So when I uh, think about this, this is because um, 
um, I think this is uh, one area that we need to get from in vitro to in vivo. So if you think about in vitro dissolution testing in apparatus versus in vivo uh, absorption transit, the hydrodynamics are very different. So that's why I, uh, I um, put, uh, put, uh, put hydrodynamics there uh, as one of the challenge area. In terms of this question, so yeah, so I um, um, so I agree that if if uh, if uh, within subject variability of hydrodynamics is not high, uh, it may it uh, it may uh, not um, so. It may not have much impact on the bicovalence, um, but may may be uh, interested in in terms of uh, bridging in vitro dissolution to in vivo performance. And, and again, it's one of those things I would imagine it's highly dependent on what you're trying to model as well, um, particularly the nature of the compound and the formulation. Um, I don't know when you've looked at extended release systems, for example, whether you, you you have a feeling for whether they're more more prone to hydrodynamic effects, for example. Do you have mm -hmm. any, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine the, the susceptibility to hydrodynamics might depend on the formulation and the way in which the drug's being released. Um, and it could also depend on whether something's highly soluble as well, if something dissolves very quickly, um, perhaps the hydrodynamics would be less important. Yeah. A good topic for debate, I think, that one. Mm -hmm. So, just a few more. Um, okay. Can the speaker comment on the number of data points they typically use when putting together an in vitro data set for use in in vitro and in vivo modeling? Typically just a few samples, approximately six are collected when generating dissolution profiles. Do they typically generate many more than six samples in their dissolution profiles? No, we usually, no, we go with whatever we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess this is where you could apply the Weibull fitting to the dissolution as well, if you only have a limited number of points. Yeah. Yeah. So this question also from Robert MacArthur. How do you select the most relevant pH for dissolution testing? Must one have both in vitro and in vivo data to make that decision? So I guess really this comes back to the discussion we had earlier about bioirrelevant dissolution, doesn't it? And the, the methods that you apply. Yeah. So yeah, in the case of uh, in in the context of generic drug application, by the time we uh, have we have generic drug application, it's, that means the drug already uh, out there for a while. So this is an advantage for us to do because by the time we do the modeling simulation, we already have. A, uh, a lot of data available uh, for us to explore. Um, yeah, but in terms of for a new drug application or new drug development, uh, maybe challenge. Mm -hmm. So I've got a, a comment come through from Walt Waltos, um, who asked an earlier question. Um, but he, he comments that an in vitro dissolution experiment that's much different from in vivo conditions should not be expected to provide an IVIVC. So deconvoluting the in vivo release provides a means to directly compare in vivo to in vitro release rates, which could lead to designing a more relevant in vitro dissolution experiment. Yeah, I but, agree. Yeah. yeah. It's really what we were saying in, in terms of um, you know, to develop that dissolution method, if, if you if you if you work back from the in vivo data, um, and yeah. you can do that extra plus, um, then you can you can use that deconvoluted data to to influence your choice of dissolution conditions. 
Yeah. So, one last question, I think. Um, I have a more general question. Confidence in using a validated absorption PBPK model to provide virtual bioequivalence assessments as supporting data. Is this a question? Um, just <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think he's saying it sort of in in respect to specification settings. Um, so I, I guess the question might be how much confidence um, should we have in terms of using a an absorption PBPK model to set specifications? So I think this is one way to um, provide. Uh, rationalized specification setting. Um, so, uh, so, well, in a lot of cases, um, if you think about how specifications are set, um, a lot of a lot of time, it's, so some in some cases we see. Uh, data support in vivo data support, but a lot of cases we are uh, it's uh, it's purely empiric um, based setting, and with with this type of tools, at least we can have some um, mechanistic models on the line uh, and provide some quantitative assessment. Good, thank you. I think that's. I, I think you've done a, an amazing job, actually, there, Susie, addressing all these questions. Um, I, I think this is probably the, the greatest number of questions that we've had on, on one webinar. So, so thank you very much for for both you know, providing today's informative webinar and you know, helping to address some of these questions and discussions. Um, thank you very much, John. So, so thank you very much indeed. Um, I will just remind everybody that the, the 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 recording of the webinar will be on the Simulations Plus website, um, so you will be able to um, to go and listen to it again. Um, and I think Susie, you just can scroll through to slide one because I think we just had a comment through just asking in terms of your name and your um, your, your title. So. Yeah, I see. Yeah, so I think that's what what people were wanting. Um, and the, the the other aspect is, it, um, Susie, you, you, you put your, um, you know, your your plug at the end in, in terms of the, um, the the opportunities within the FDA for modelling positions. So again, if if you want Susie's email for that, that will be on the um, the, the the webinar recording. So thank you everybody for joining. Thanks again to Susie. And um, we look forward to interacting again on a, a future webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bye. John. Thanks, everyone.